again up in Tuscaloosa last night what I preached here a few weeks ago on help from the sanctuary. Again, I was reminded as Abijah and the children of Judah were trapped in front and behind by their brethren, the children of Israel, coming to war against them. And Abijah begged Jeroboam, he said, don't do this. You've forsaken God, but we're, we're still serving the Lord. You've brought in false priests, and we still have the sons of Levi. Sanctify themselves and burn incense unto God every morning. And make sure the lamp, the golden lamps, are full of oil. They burn every evening. He said they still do the service for the Lord. And he said, God has not forsaken us. And he said, I'm warning you, don't fight against us. Because if you do, God's going to fight for us. And it's going to be bad on you. And the Bible said that when uh, they looked, and there was an ambushment behind them. They realized they were outnumbered two to one and about to be attacked. And the children of Judah cried unto the Lord. And that's symbolic of prayer when the people pray. So then the, the priests put their mouths to the trumpet. And they blew the trumpet of the Lord. And that's symbolic of the preached word. And then it says, then all the men of Judah shouted with a shout. God came down in the camp of the children of Judah and he slew 500 out of the 800,000 uh, men of Israel that come against Judah. He slew 500 of the 800,000 and put the rest to flight. Well, I, I said that to say this. It means a whole lot to God. You can have people to pray and God show up. The preacher, the musician, and the singers can be anointed and speak and, and play and sing under the power of the Holy Ghost and God show up. But I want to tell you there is a big, big, big responsibility on how we respond. It matters on what we do with what God does. On how we respond to, to what God is saying. And I said to that church, and I never, it just kind of came to me as I was preaching last night, but the Lord laid upon my heart and he said, to say to that church, he said, like a groomsman, who's courting a would-be bride. Everything that he's done up to that point, every date he's carried her on, all the you know gifts he's bought her, all the time that's been spent, all the love and the adoration shown up to that point, now he's on one knee. and He's got a, a hand extended and he's saying unto her, will you marry me? It don't really matter what's all happened up to that point if the response right. is not there. That's right. If she don't respond to that hand, everything that he's done up to that point can all be for naught. If she don't accept that hand, and all of that time spent could be for naught. Those men of Judah shouted in response to, the, to those ministers blowing the trumpet or to the preacher preaching. I want to tell you when God saw their response in the affirmative, that yes Lord we hear and oh God we do believe God came down. Amen. I'm glad to be in a house where God gets an affirmative response. It matters when we step forward and meet God in the altar with hands extended toward heaven. Holy Ghost will come down. God's a healer. If nobody reaches up, nobody will get healed. Yeah. He's a savior, but if nobody cries out to the Lord for mercy and grace, nobody's getting saved. Yeah. Amen. He's still baptizing men and women in the power of the Holy Ghost, but if nobody seeks for it, then nobody will be filled. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to read tonight out of the book of 2 Peter. Chapter number one, we'll begin reading with verse number one. 
So good to see our Wilson family back with us tonight. Amen. Anchoring down their place. Amen. It looks good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I must say it looks real good with them over there. Amen. Words are inadequate to describe how much I love and care about uh, Brother David, Sister Megan, and all those babies. I am extremely proud of what God has wrought in their life. And I'm extremely proud to, to, that I can say I'm their pastor and, uh, and that they're a part of our church family. I just want them to know how appreciative I am every time they walk through these doors. If you're visiting with us tonight, what a joy it is to have you. And the church family is here. Minus the boys and the daughter-in-laws, but it's the church family nonetheless. Brother Keith, so good to have you stand and say a word, brother. God for mom. She got him to stay over. <laughs> Amen. Sister Grace testify. Always good to see you. I have found everywhere I've gone, you know, you, you don't have to look too hard for the devil. He's, he, he works everywhere, no matter what country. He's there working, but also everywhere I've gone, I've found a remnant of God's people there. And they're invading the darkness. And they're warring against the powers of hell. And they're sowing the seed of the gospel. He's coming back after church after a bride that's made herself ready, I'm going to be a part of it when he does. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to read again out of Second Peter, chapter number 2, beginning with verse number 1. I got that wrong. It's Second Peter, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Then you have a semicolon right here. And he tells us why there's been given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, there's more is what he said. And beside all of that, Given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind cannot see afar off, hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling 
and election sure. Here it is. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Hallelujah. If you do these things, you shall never fall. I want to preach to you on faith's additives. Faith's additives. We've got, if you buy food out of the grocery store, if you look on the label, usually you'll find additives and preservatives. Preservatives give it the shelf life, but the additives usually is what put something on your waist. I, me and Brother Joe was talking about you just about can't find anything in the store that sugar is not added into. Uh, sugar comes. I know sugar makes everything taste sweeter and taste better. It don't mean it's all that good for you, does it? And, uh, but Peter mentions in our text tonight to add to faith. And these additives... He said, if you'll put these additives and mix them in with your faith, it'll give you a surety that you'll never fall. Right. Amen. So I want to preach on faith's additives tonight. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit. We've been made to feel this morning again tonight. You're a good God. You've been so good to me, and I love you for it. God, I thank you for how you've talked to us and how you've touched us and strengthened us by your spirit around the altar. I thank you, Lord, for the revival services we've been in. There's been plenty of them lately, how you've moved and stirred and worked. God, I haven't forgotten. God, words that you've spoken to me in the secret place of prayer, and even by a word of prophecy several weeks ago about what you're about to do, and I've begun to see the first fruits of it. My, my heart and soul rejoices tonight. So, Lord, I just yield to you, myself, my life, my body. It's your vessel, and I believe in you for the miraculous. God, for the, for the power of the Holy Ghost to come and shake us in this altar tonight and just have your way in every one of us. God, you're a Savior to heal or, or to save the, uh, those that are lost. You're a healer to heal those that are sick. You're still he that baptizes in the Holy Ghost and with fire. Come and fill us again around this altar tonight. We pray. We ask it in Christ's name. If you love the Lord, would you say amen? amen. This is, a, to me, a very foundational passage of Scripture. And we'd do well to make it a part of our everyday prayer lives. We'd be better Christians, the Bible said, if we would do that. Again, he said, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. He's writing to those who have obtained like precious faith. Another place he said, your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes. Faith is very precious. There's only one faith. That is the faith that is from God and in Christ. That's right. Amen. Somebody said, well, I've got faith in you. We, you know, even we say our wedding vows, we pledge our faith to our spouse. But you understand those vows are no good at all if we don't maintain our faith right. in Christ. Amen. Someone's faith in me is not very well placed if I don't have faith in Christ. And no wonder the Apostle Paul said, follow me only as I follow Christ. So he's writing to those who have obtained like precious faith. If you were like me, you would just, all these verses are highlighted in my Bible. You've got that highlighter pen. You especially need to highlight the word obtained. Peter says faith has to be obtained. And why would he say that? Because a lot of people know how to be saved. They're just not. 
And that was me for 22 years. Yeah. I knew how to be saved. I just never was. Hell is going to be full of people who knew how to be saved, especially in America, but never were. As preachers, we have to make sure, and as Christians, we have to make sure, as laity in the church, we have to make sure that we are saved ourselves. He goes on in verse 2 and says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. He's saying that we obtained like precious faith, and as we did, God gave us in return by obtaining faith, he gave us his divine power. And for what? It says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Why did God give us or grant unto us divine power? As he said, and unto them, or unto as many as believed, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. God gave us divine power. Why or for what purpose? To live a life of godliness in order that we might be partakers, he said, of Christ's divine nature. In order that you might be Christ-like in the earth. Yeah. Verse four, he said, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We're to be partakers of the divine nature. The divine nature is Christ's holy nature. Adam's nature, the Adamic nature, or the carnal nature of unregenerate man is to sin. Is to live carnal. Is to live worldly, fleshly. You know, uh, the Bible said the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, uh, and the pride of life. All these uh, are not of the Father, but they're of the world. And if any man loves the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. And the only way we can escape uh, those things uh, is through the divine nature yeah. of Jesus Christ. Right. There has to be a change. Oh, what a change. He's made in me. That's what we were just singing. Oh, what a change. He's made in me. Singing about the divine nature that we've been made partakers of. It's called being born again. So as Christians, as children of God, we're called to live godly lives first and foremost in front of our family, in front of our children, and secondly, in front of the lost, yeah. we're to live holy and godly and Christ-like. Notice the word, all diligence. And beside this, in verse 5, giving all diligence add to your faith. He's saying that we should do everything we can. That's all diligence. Do everything that's in your power to add unto this faith that you have obtained. This like precious faith, uh, once you've obtained it, once you've been made partaker of the divine nature, you've escaped the corruption of the world, you know, through that lust, you've escaped all of that, you've been born again, you're saved. And now that you're saved, add to your faith right. these things. Amen. He said, if you'll do these, if you'll, if you'll make sure these faith additives are a part of your life, you'll never fall. You'll never fall. Our spiritual life, he says, depends on these faith additives. There are seven things. Seven is one of God's numbers of completion, perfection. There are seven things here that God says that we should add to our faith. I want to 
go through them. And I want you to answer as I do in your heart. Am I giving all diligence to add this unto my faith as I walk with God? First Peter says we need to add to our faith virtue. The dictionary defines virtue as moral excellence, goodness, righteousness, or better said, integrity. Yeah, right. To be men or women of integrity. As preachers, we need to be men and women of integrity, I can tell you. That's right. As laity in the church, leaders in the church, we should be men and women of integrity. All right. We're going to serve God on the platform. We ought to be men and women of integrity. Yeah. Can you say amen? Yeah. I mean the church ought to be able to have confidence in you that you're living right. Yeah. And then sinners ought to know one thing about you. Those people, I might not live like they live. I might not go to church with them. I might not uh, do all that. But those people live right. Yeah. They're not liars. They're not adulterers. They, 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 they treat people like they ought to be treated. They show up to work. They do a good job. The favor of God is upon them. And you can just see the difference in their life. That's what it is to live a life of integrity. There's very little integrity left in our world. I mean from Washington the White House all the way down to the poor house, you got to search far and wide for men and women of integrity. Me and Brother Joey, I try not to talk about it, but on the way up, you got four hours, you do a lot of talking. Tuscaloosa, and I, I hate to talk about Washington. When I was talking about that bill passed, I said, good grief, man. We need to go, need to march on Washington again like they did in the Revolutionary War. When America gained her independence, there needs to be a march on Washington to say to every one of them, get out. Right, right. Just a bunch of corrupt, yeah. greedy, wicked, lying leaders. You're not our representatives. You're misrepresentatives. Yeah. Every word out of your mouth is a lie. Yeah, right, right. Every motive and goal is corruption in mind. Yeah. You're thieves and robbers, and you're wrecking our land and wrecking our nation. Integrity is hard to find. Right. But it shouldn't be that way in God's kingdom. Right. We live in the kingdom of God as born again people. Yes. Amen. Jesus said when you pray, pray our Father which art in heaven, hallowed or holy be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Not on earth, but in earth as it is in heaven. This body right here is earth. It's an earthen vessel made from the earth. Let your will be done in earth. What did Christ pray? Not my will be done. Your will be done in me. Right. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. He said the kingdom will come with power. And it did on the day of Pentecost. Right. What does the Holy Ghost do? It governs, uh, it, it governs uh, this body. It governs our will. It governs our spirit. And we live out uh, God's will in the body. That's what it is to be a child of God. And one of the most beautiful things about being in the kingdom of God is that in the kingdom, it's a kingdom of integrity. That's right. In the kingdom, you know there are no cussers in the, in the kingdom. I say that all the time. I'm going to keep saying it yeah. until every cussing preacher hears me. Yeah. There are no cussers in the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Right. Only that that edifies. Yeah. Right. Right. Talk right. Come on. Kingdom people talk right. Yeah. They talk pure. Yeah. They talk holy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Woo, hallelujah to God. Well, everybody, get, I heard a church of God preachers, I heard him say it with my own ears. He said, hey, everybody cusses a little on a bad golf day. 
All of his staff preachers were on the platform. He said, I don't know one of them up here that hadn't cussed on a bad golf day. He said, when I was a boy growing up in the church of God, they told us, uh, if you cuss, you was backslid. He said, uh, we've learned better than that. God's a merciful God full of grace. And I said, he sure is. That's why you're still behind that pulpit. He had not knocked you down. Teaching those, hey, they gave, him a, they gave him a big old hand clap, standing up. While he's advocating all of his staff, cussing. I continue to say, don't, don't trust a cussing preacher. I mean, if you're sitting under a preacher that'll cuss, I'd just ease on out. Find me somewhere else to go. Amen. I, my pastor wouldn't be allowed to cuss. I want to tell you, if my pastor heard me cuss, he would ask me, when'd you backslide? Yeah. We're talking about integrity still. Add to your faith virtue, integrity. Live with integrity. Right. Live like kingdom people and born again people ought to be living. The Bible commands it. As God's people, he expects us to be people of integrity. Amen. When uh, we go to Africa, have an ordination service, the wife comes up and she is she kneels with the they wear these robes and I mean when they when they get ordained you anoint them with anointing oil and it ain't like that it's a it's a bull's horn and they fill the whole horn up with oil. Every, every pastor gets the whole horn, him and his wife. It just, they just get saturated and drenched with it. <laughs> and after he is, I guess, covered and saturated in that oil before he is allowed to be ordained, his wife has to stand and testify to the congregation that her husband is a man of God. If your wife don't believe you're a man of God, guess what? You ain't one. <laughs> and ladies, if your husband don't believe or know that you're a woman of God, you're probably not one. I remember going to the Beaumont Convention with the School of Christ way back when, and Brother Clinton and preached. I don't know the exact message he preached, but he always preached us under conviction. We felt like we wasn't half saved when he got done preaching. And he said, the next day we came back for the morning service, and he got up and he said, I'll tell you, God moved in this house last night. He said, when we came to prayer meeting this morning, he said, there's a preacher already here waiting on me. Eyes swole shut with tears. Came from out of state somewhere to be in that meeting. Said he had a five-year-old boy, and he said, we left, left the convention to go to the hotel last night. He said, my five-year-old boy was sitting in the back seat. And he said, you'd been preaching. He said, my five-year-old boy reached up and tapped me on the shoulder. He said, Daddy. He said, what is it, buddy? He said, that preacher was talking about you tonight. He said, it smoked me. Say so you can fool a lot of people, but you can't fool your children. He said, when I got back to that hotel room, I told him he sure was, buddy. He sure was, and I'm so sorry. He said, I've laid in that floor all night, and I was the first one here this morning begging God, change me, Lord. Change me. We need to be men and women of integrity. I think of these babies. They wrote me a happy birthday card from Children's Church this morning. I think of those babies. I laughed. Some of their sister Paige might have called what we love about Brother Eddie. 
I love Brother Eddie because he's a great preacher. I love Brother Eddie because he's so sweet. I love Brother Eddie because he's kind to me. I love Brother Eddie because he holds me, but he's sweaty. <laughs> and that would be Miss Abby that says that. And she says, that little girl loves you. And I said, she does. And then Kim, classic Kim, she said, I don't know why. <laughs> And I said, I don't know either. I don't want to let them down. I don't want to let them down. I want my children, I want my grandbabies, and I want your babies to view me as a man of integrity. Your reputation is what others say about you. But your character what your wife and kids know about you. And everything we do with all diligence, he said, add virtue to your faith. Second, he said, we need to add to our virtue knowledge. The word knowledge here is the Greek word gnosko. And it is simply a word that means to be intimate with someone. It's usually the word used to describe the intimacy between a husband and a wife. I know you. Some of you, I know you well. We are good friends. Some of you, I know you well because we are family. And then as church family, we're like family. We know each other very well. We can see the looks upon somebody's face, the grief that they're carrying in their countenance, the, if their heart is rejoicing or if it's sad. We, we can discern that because we are very closely acquainted, but nobody knows me like Kim Sullivan does. My mom knows me very closely as my mom, but my wife knows me even more intimately than she. We have lived uh, in the same home for 32 years. She knows every button to push. <laughs> she knows what she can say, what she can get by with. <laughs> she said, usually if something's gone terribly wrong, she comes up to me and she looks at me real sweet. She says, how much do you love me? And I say, well, what have you done? We add to our knowledge, or we add rather to our virtue, knowledge. Knowledge means intimacy. God is saying, I want you to give all diligence to get as close to me yeah. as you can. Amen. To be spiritually intimate with me, you have to be a man or woman of prayer. You have to be a man or woman of the word of God. You have to open your Bible, read it, study it, rehearse it, memorize it, yes. search it, become familiar with it, yeah. fall in love with it. Yes. Then stay upon your knees or on your face in prayer and become intimate with God. So intimate uh, that if he whispers, you hear him. I know some people God has to shout at them to get their attention. I want to be intimate with the Lord that if he were to whisper my name, I hear the Lord speaking to me. Hallelujah. If we're not intimate with God, we can't lead others to be, to be intimate with God in their relationship. If we're not close to God, then those around us certainly won't be. To be intimate with God requires at least four things. Prayer, fasting, the study of his word, and then the application of his word. Yeah. If you're doing those four things, you're going to grow in intimacy with the Lord. And so will those in your home, those around you. Third, Peter says that we should 
add to our knowledge temperance. That's a good one. Temperance is usually required of all of us every day of our life. The word temperance very simply defines self-control. God puts a high priority on us getting ourselves under control in every area of our life, in our finance. We should get our spending under control. Amen. Amen. I'm just going to move on from that. <laughs> Joe Biden's going to help you with it if you can't, if God can't. We should, in every area of our life, be under control. In our finance, in our appetites. Woo! Preach, Brother Eddie. In our temperament. We shouldn't be mean. As a rattlesnake. It's hard. Somebody says, I can't help it. I've got that Sullivan temper. You can help. It. Just crucify the Sullivan and let the Christ part live. Amen. That little grandson of mine, redheaded. You know what? What one thing about them redheads are, don't you? Hot headed. I've seen him throw them little temper tantrums. Woo wee. Brother Corey. Sister Kirsten. <laughs> Bless the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know what has to happen? We have to learn how to be temperate or control ourselves, getting ourselves under control. Somebody said, man, what happened? We lost control. We lost our temper. temper. We usually excuse our behavior by saying that's just how I am. You know me. You know how I am. You know I can be you know, can get kind of cross. You know if I don't get my rest, I can just uh, be mean sometimes. Well, Lord have mercy, get some rest. <laughs> but get your temper, get your finances, get your appetites under control. Amen. God wants us to act to our temperance, patience. Patience stems from self-control. Patience is letting God do what he wants to do, when he wants to do it. You ever been on a trip? Somebody said, we're there yet? <laughs> we almost there? No. How much longer we got? Two hours. Poppy, how long has it been? One hour. How much longer we got? An hour. Are we getting close yet? Are we there yet? Nope. 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 Yeah. Be patient. We're getting there. We're going in the right direction. Yeah. Amen. That's not just grandbabies. That's adults. That's how we act with our Heavenly Father. You done it yet? Sent that miracle yet? Sent that blessing my way yet? Talked to that boss about my promotion yet? Lord, what about it? I'm waiting on an answer. Are we there yet? We get that way with God. God's saying here, I want you to leave the driving to me. I want you to trust me enough to let me do things the way I want to do them. When I want to do them, 
and not like you think I should do them. I told that pastor last night, share with Brother Minks a little bit of his testimony, but they, that building that they're in was originally up for sale for $1.6 million. It's in a very dangerous neighborhood, is the way I'll put it. Drive-by shootings and drug deals. And it's just in a very bad place. It, it went belly up and church busted all up because of corruption, because there was no integrity in the pulpit. It busted all up and went into foreclosure. And a billionaire out of Israel that does business here in the state, sight unseen. It's just a foreclosure property. He sucked it up. Just bought it. Put it back on the market for 1.6 million. That's what it appraised at. He said we went by, looked at it, at just out of curiosity, asked a realtor, "How much is this building up? 1.6 million? <laughs> you interested? I am, but 1.6 million might as well be 1.6 billion to me." That's what he told him. He said, "Well, man, we we haven't had a whole lot of interest. We'll talk to the owner and see if he." Willing to work with you. When that rocked on him, asking prices, he said, look, man, I'm trying to pioneer work, and there's two things we don't have. We don't have no people. We don't have no money. Yeah. We just got a vision. <laughs> he come back to him, he said, look, he's going to make you a deal that you can't refuse. He's going to give you this property. For one hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars, just a tenth of what the appraisal was, because that's probably most likely what he got it for in foreclosure. He just won't out of it. He said one hundred sixty-five thousand might as well be one point six million. I don't have it. It's like wow, man, we just made you a deal. Can't refuse, he said. I ain't refusing it. I'm just telling you, I don't have it. So he called him back and he said, He said that he will owner finance it for you. But you just need to give him a big down pay. <laughs> I won't get into the whole length of the story, but through a, a set of circumstances, his parents' home flooded out. And they had a Recording studio in the basement. Lost, it was a total loss, lost everything. After they made the insurance claim, they, you know, bought stuff at reduced price like anybody would to try to save as much money as they could. They had enough money left over after the insurance claim to make the down payment that the billionaire was going to require in order to do their owner finances so they got a building. We were, we were talking about struggles. He said, man, some of the things you preached, he said, I couldn't do nothing but weep. He said, it's the very thing that I that I face. It's the very things that I struggle. He said, I can't tell you the extremity of the struggle here in this neighborhood, in this huge, massive building with very little people and so much still to be done. The enormity, the impossibility of it all, the absolute struggle, the questioning in my mind, did I bite off more than I could chew? God, what am I doing? He said, you can't even get people to fellowship because everybody is so far. He said, it's just so utterly lonely sometimes and the weight gets so heavy and I've made the statement sometimes that God's strength can only be realized in the struggle. Yeah, man. The apostle said, when I am weak, then am I made, made strong. That the excellency of the power is of God and not of me. Yeah. And I told him this just sitting at the table. I said, there are times that I struggled so mightily that Bible way as a pastor, feeling like a failure, 
staring at an empty pew or, or not seeing the results that I wanted to see, had that church been debt free and paid off, I could have walked. Not feeling any regret or any remorse. And I said, I've looked back on it now. Hindsight's 2020. I've looked back on it now after being here 20 years. And God kept debt on top of me to keep me in his will. You know what? I, I always said I'll never leave my church family indebted. Never happened. So God kept me indebted to my church family. God kept me indebted to Foley, Alabama, yeah. to Baldwin County, because this is where he wanted me to be. Sometimes the answer is not the way that you, I'm praying the whole time, God, I, there, were, there were times we, we barely had enough coming in to make the note. I'm working a secular job. And there's barely enough coming in to even make the note. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, did I miss God? Sister Barbara Williams always tells the story. She says, brother, are you sure? We're in the will of God. I said, yeah, I'm sure. Why would you ask? Only two reasons, because we got no people, no money. I said, man, those are the same two reasons I keep talking to God about. Yeah. But he keeps telling me. That it's his church and he knows what he's doing and I need to trust him. So, yeah, I believe we're in the will of God. This, in spite of the fact that we have no people or no money, we're not there, man. We're blessed. Thank God for it. We're blessed. And I'm just telling you, sometimes God does it in a way that you wouldn't have done it. Yeah. I would have had God. Lord, there's a, there's a millionaire somewhere. I, I heard about a church across town doing outreach down at the Gulf. Budweiser's grandson's down there and they're doing the outreach. He said, man, I appreciate what y'all doing. I'm going to give y'all stock in our company. Gave them stock in Budweiser. They sold it, paid their whole, paid their whole church off. I said, Lord, I don't know that I want no Budweiser stock. But I wouldn't mind somebody coming along just Hey, I appreciate y'all. I like what you're doing here. Let me just pay for that. Man, I'd like that. The Lord said, if I do that, first thing that come along, you wouldn't have nothing to anchor you down, boy. You just fly away. I'm just going to leave this with you. I'm going to leave you indebted to those people that I want you to be with. And that's my way of keeping you in my will. I look back there and I see that now and I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He knows how to build a church. I don't. <laughs> Somebody that watches our live stream all the time told that their pastor watches our live stream all the time and their church is struggling. And their pastor was really discouraged one day and he said, why does he get to pastor a church like that? People that, you know, play and sing and people that respond in worship. It was one of them services where I was preaching and people was walking up and down the aisles shouting and rejoicing. It ain't like that every service, but a lot of times it is. How, do, how does he get to pastor a church like that? I'm stuck here where nobody will say Amen. Well, buddy, I'd just like to tell you. <laughs> there have been a few times I couldn't have bought an amen with a hundred dollar bill. My question was I in the right place. God. God knows what he's doing in my life. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a long time to get me where he wants me to be. And I'm so impatient, God, I'm ready. I'm ready for revival. Lord, I'm ready for you to add to the church. Lord, I'm ready for you to send deliverance. Lord, I'm ready for you to work miracles. Lord, I'm ready for you to do it. Do it now, now, now. Let's see it happen. I watch young people. Come on. I watch young people. I, I, 
Listen, I, I look in that mirror and I'm always the first to blame. But if you can't get it high enough, if you can't provide enough entertainment, if it's not enough fun and games, fly away, fly away, fly away. Why? Because we won't give God time to do in us what needs to be done. Yeah. If we don't get it our way, it's not Burger King. You can't just have it your way. I need to move on. We need patience, don't we? We need to add to our faith. We need to add to temperance, patience. Then we need, he said, we need to add to our patience, godliness. Well, that's pretty self-explanatory. The word godliness means God-likeness. God expects us to be like him. That doesn't just happen. You don't just roll out of bed one day and say, I'm godly today. <laughs> to be godly is a choice. We become more or less godlike by the choices we make every day in our life. If we choose to watch things, listen to things, or participate in things that are not godly, then guess what? We won't be a godly person. If you choose to go to places that are not godly, you won't become a godly person. That's why I like going to church. That's why I like going to revival. That's why I like going to youth camp or youth conference. I like it because it has helped to shape and mold my life to make me a godly person. You choose to partake in things that are not godly, then we won't be a godly person. Whatever is not helping you to get closer to God and making you more God-like, then I would scratch that out or eliminate that from my daily routine. Peter says we need to add to our godliness, and we're on the sixth additive, so... I am about to land the plane. We need to add to our godliness brotherly kindness. It's pretty self-explanatory. Romans 12 and 10 says, Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. Galatians 6 and 10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. God expects us to show Brotherly kindness to everyone, yeah. but especially to those who love God. It don't cost anything to be nice. Right. It don't cost anything to be nice. Right. It doesn't matter to me if they walk in with a mini skirt and fishnet stocking. And somebody says, don't they know this is a hole in this church? Probably not. But even if they do, and they're coming in out of spite and rebellion, it don't cost me nothing to be nice. They're not taking nothing away from me or this church when they come in like that. It don't matter if the hair is pink, blue, purple, Red or green, yellow, don't matter. If there's body piercings, tattoos, or scantly anything at all, because we're in a beach town, you're liable to see anything. Say amen. You go to Walmart, you can see just about anything. Say amen, Brother Daniel. <laughs> Meanwhile, at Walmart, <laughs> I told Brother Joy last night, man, you preach a funeral. There's no respect. They come to church, dress like, they, like they're going to Walmart. I ain't their parent, but I want to walk up to them and say, come on, man. I mean, old ragged out T-shirt, 
pair of dingy khaki short pants and flip flops with your sunglasses propped up on your head. Show some respect. I see them come to a wedding. You know, most weddings are pretty formal. Bride's got a wedding gown on. Husband, you know, decked out in a suit or a tuxedo. You see them come to a wedding just as slouchy and dressed down as they can. I'm like, come on, man. I need to quit, though. But having said that, no matter how they come, no matter how they are, they are what they are. And it didn't cost me nothing to smile at them, shake their hand, greet them, tell them I'm happy they're here, ask them, invite them to come back, show them brotherly kindness. Because the world is in short supply of it. Most people aren't. They're going to look at them, scoff at them, cuss at them, and not want them anywhere around. It may be that your brotherly kindness, something in their heart, is enticed to come back. Surely their best hope is to come back and hear the gospel. I used to be worried. Oh, man, this preacher's coming to preach me a meeting. Somebody's, you know, just started coming here and they don't look just for, I don't worry about that at all. If there's a shallot they're going to preach or what they see and not what they hear in the closet, they won't be back. I'm going to show brotherly kindness because that's the very least we can do. Sometimes, sometimes we treat others better than we treat ourselves. We can love people that we don't even know. When we get home, we snap at our wives. Brethren, show brotherly kindness. Because she's saved just like you are. She belongs to the body of Christ just like you do. Treat her like you would anybody else in the house of God. If you wouldn't say it to me, then don't say it to her. Finally, Peter says that we should add to our brotherly kindness charity. The Greek word for charity is agape. It's a word used to describe God's love. 1 John 4 and 8, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love, or God is agape. He's saying that if we know God, we're going to love other people because God is love, and God so loved the world that he gave under this world, the gift of his son. If we love God and God lives in us, then that love will be manifested through us. So when we're saved, Jesus comes to live in our hearts and he fills our heart with his love. When God baptized us in the Holy Ghost, he says in Romans 5 and 5, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. The word shed abroad are interesting. One word in the Greek means to pour forth or to gush out. He's saying that when we're filled with the Holy Ghost, the love of God gushes out of us. That's good. Woo! Yes. That's what we need yeah. when we're at home with our wife and children. We need the love of God to gush out of our heart. It's what we need when we walk through the doors of the church for the love of God to gush out of our heart. It's what we need when we walk onto a wicked job site where men are cursing and telling all manner of vile tales and stories. We need the love of God to gush forth out of our heart. Then I like the next verse. For if these things be in you and abound, They make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says they make you. If you want to be a fruitful Christian, you need faith additives to abound in your life. If you want to be a fruitful lay worker in the church, you need these seven things to abound in your life. But lastly, he warns us 
of what will happen if they, these things are not there. But he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. If these seven things are not abounding in your life, God says you have gone blind. I don't know anybody here that would like to go blind. If the blind lead the blind, Jesus said everybody goes in the ditch. I carry Brother Joseph's sister Helen home. I get her out. She's legally blind, can only see something that's literally right in front of her face. But I have to lead her around to his side. He gets out. He puts his hand on her shoulder. I'm leading her. She's leading him. But I, there have been times when I trusted that she could make her way to the door. And she just takes that walker. And she did walk right off the right off the concrete, right off the pavement. And if and if she didn't have that walker to dip down and she's just walking and walk right off the pavement. She's going down and he's going down with her. Blind lead to blind, everybody goes down. He said, if you don't add these things to your life, you'll go blind. If you go blind, you know what you're going to do, Dad? You're going to leave your you're going to lead your wife and children right off a spiritual cliff. You can't see. So we need to add to our faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity at the very least so we can see, so we don't go blind. If your spiritual vision is a little blurry, you're probably lacking some additives in your life. You need to find out what they are. You need to work on them in your prayer time. Amen. I know that's not a shout message, Curse, if you'll help me tonight. I know it don't give us reason maybe to, to run laps, but it does encourage me Amen. that I can live godly. Yeah. That I have been made partaker of God's precious promises been made partaker of God's divine nature that I'm not blind but I can see where I'm going I can see how close we are to the rapture I can see what we lack the additives maybe that are missing that would make me spiritually whole or complete or mature what might be lacking in my home or in my family, what might be lacking in our church, and that I can add to my faith. Hallelujah. Brother Kenny preached Thursday night on the lost coin. He said, it's not gone. It's only lost. It's in the house. It's there. She lit a candle. She pulled out a broom. She started sweeping. She started doing a deep clean. She found it. He said that woman's a type of the church. It's there in Luke 15 as a prophetic utterance by Christ that as a type of the church before the Lord was to return, the church will have lost something precious. The fact she had a light of candles says that she was living in the dark. She couldn't see. Very well could mean what Peter's talking about. We've allowed our vision to get too blurry. and We've lost some sight or vision. We have become blind, he said, but you can correct that vision. You know, a lot of us just correct our vision by putting these on. It's I have a restriction on my driver's license. Last time I went to get license, they tell you to pull your glasses off and they do that eye test. And I'm like, 
What's that last line saying? I'm like, I, I, I don't know. I can't see any of them. He said, congratulations. He said it like that. Congratulations. I said, what? He said, you now got a restriction on your license. You can't drive without glasses. I said, you not tell me that. I ain't drove without glasses in a long time. He said, but now you get a ticket if you don't have them all. I said, well, I don't need no ticket. To let me know that I can't see without these glasses on. I got them on everywhere I go. As soon as, I, as soon as my feet hit the floor, I'm reaching for my glasses, putting them on. Because I don't want to be blind. I want to see. There's something I'm lacking in my spiritual life. I want to reach for the answer. If I can add something to my faith, that'll correct my vision. I want to reach for it tonight. So I want to see. Hallelujah. He said that woman's a type of the church is prophetic, but she would lose something. He said, but most people don't believe that God's going to send revival. He said, but if I can have faith that something's been lost, I see in that story that it was found. I can have faith that God is going to do something in the church. We're going to find what's been lost. God's going to send revival to his church. I'm as encouraged as I've ever been about seeing a move of God in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm as encouraged as I've ever been about seeing my lost family saved and born again. I'm as encouraged as I've ever been about reaching those that are within our reach because when they see the signs and the wonders and the amazing things that God is doing in the lives of his people, they're going to wake up to the fact I need Jesus. Amen. How many of you come meet me in this altar and we'll add to our faith tonight? Amen. We'll reach for faith's additives tonight. Hallelujah.